take on Storyboard in a television exclusive to Storyboard's Ankita Saxena, worldwide chairman and CEO of Mediacom Stephen Allen speaks about his excitement for the Indian market. And Ogilvy India has rebranded its merged companies Soho Square and Bates Tree and Partners as 82.5 Communications. And what is the story behind 82.5 Communications? We have Shumanthu Chattopadhyay and B. S. Srikant answering that for us today. Hello and welcome to Storyboard. This is Shibani Gharat. But before we begin the show, let's take a look at what was hot and happening this week in the world of advertising. In a run-up to the Lok Sabha elections, the Election Commission has sought a ban on political advertising on social media and digital platforms in the final 48 hours before the elections. At present, Section 126 of the Representation of People Act prevents electronic media from airing political advertising in the silent period before elections. The EC is said to have written to the Law Ministry suggesting to extend the provisions under Section 126 to digital and print media as well. In related news, Facebook has restricted external agencies from accessing and scrutinizing its political ads for transparency by changing its codes. The clampdown on third-party agencies comes ahead of the 2019 elections in India and after announcing fresh steps in December to increase transparency of political ads to prevent foreign forces from influencing the election outcome. On its part, Facebook said the changes were part of crackdown on third-party plugins. British advertising tycoon Sir Martin Sorrell has been asked to repay about £1,70,000 in personal expenses to WPP, according to the Wall Street Journal. The report said the former WPP chief had charged a ski trip travel for his wife and child and items for an apartment in New York to WPP over a number of years and that WPP is seeking further reimbursement for other expenses as well. In April last year, Sorel stepped down from WPP after 33 years over accusations of misusing company funds. And finally, let's take a look at the measures announced for the media and entertainment sector by Finance Minister Piyush Goel in his interim budget. Acknowledging India's love for Bollywood, Goel announced measures to boost Indian filmmaking and fight piracy in interim budget. Goel announced that single window clearance for ease of shooting films, which was earlier only available to foreign filmmakers, will now be available for Indian filmmakers as well. In a bid to fight movie piracy, Goel also said that anti-cam corder provisions would be introduced soon. Entertainment industry is a major employment generator. To promote entertainment industry, single window clearance for ease of shooting films, earlier available only to foreigners, is now going to be made available to Indian filmmakers as well. Now let's get on with the rest of the show. In a television exclusive to Storyboard's Ankita Saxena, worldwide chairman and CEO of Mediacom, Stephen Allen, speaks about his excitement for the Indian market and he also tells us why Mediacom doesn't call itself a media agency anymore. With a career spanning over three decades in the business of media, he has a pulse on what the clients want and the changing media landscape. I have with me Worldwide Chairman and CEO of Mediacom, Stephen Allen. Stephen, welcome to CNBC TV 18. Thank you for having me. So Stephen, tell us what brings you to India. It's a rather short trip, so what's on the agenda? We, we have a new CEO here yes. in India, Nevin Kemka, and I thought I'd better come and check in on him, see okay. how he's getting on. Uh, so it is a relatively short trip, but it's part of a, a wider Asia tour that I've been on in uh, China and Japan and Australia. Uh, so now heading uh, westwards back. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I always love coming to India. Uh, it's a really important market for us. Okay. Stephen, tell me, uh, with media fragmentation and proliferation of uh, digital platforms like Facebook and Google, and then there are these consultancies like Accenture stepping into your turf, uh, how does a media agency keep itself relevant? I mean, you have recrescent yourself from a media agency to content plus uh, uh, connections agency. Mm -hmm. Content and connections, that's correct. 
uh, that's what I love about my job. And this is my 37th year in Mediacom and 10th year running it globally. And, and the truth of the matter is that uh, we, have to we have to constantly reinvent ourselves. So, you know, if I go back to when I first started, uh, all we really had to think about was a few television channels and a bit of radio and a few newspapers. And of course then there was something that came along called the internet yeah. that made us rethink everything. And what we see every time uh, is it brings around a whole new generation of specialists. Mm -hmm. So agencies uh, rise up who specialize in whatever the newest thing is. So, you know, at the time it would be internet and search mm -hmm then uh, move on mobile and now social media, uh, content and all these different areas. And every time, every time that that happens, it's, it's, it's always a wake up call for us. Uh, and we get our act together, uh, we, we, we evolve, we hire people with new knowledge from different areas. Uh, and I think actually the important point here is that what our clients want is uh, they don't want lots of people giving them lots of different answers. They want one answer, uh, one solution, I should say, one joined up answer to a business challenge. Uh, and therefore, it's important that we are absolutely on top of all of these new developments so that we are relevant. You know, in the morning, I was reading this article which said that um, Facebook and Google, who have still now enjoyed the lion's share of ad spends, mm -hmm. are faced with stiff competition from digital platforms like, uh, Hot, like Hotstar and Daily Hunt. So it's a hugely fragmented uh, market and so is the media measurement now. How do you help a marketer uh, navigate this treacherous terrain? Uh, we have a lot of data mm. that goes behind what we do and the advice and the recommendations mm. that we give. Uh, I. I think in a, in, a, in a bizarre and ironic way, and I'll mm. go back to your previous yeah. question, uh, the more complex and fragmented mm. the media marketplace becomes, yeah. in a sense, the more advertisers need specialist advice from companies like us yeah. to help navigate yeah. their way through it. So we're not, we're not worried about that. Uh, we, we know an awful lot about these platforms, uh, about uh, the people that are using them. And I think, the, I think the important point here is that Google or Facebook have very, very deep knowledge about their own platforms, mm. more than anybody else could ever have. Mm. I think what we bring is that wider perspective. So mm. what we understand is the whole spectrum mm. of these platforms and therefore giving our clients very objective mm. and independent advice mm. about the, west, the best way to talk hmm. to and communicate with their audiences. Okay. You know, I was speaking to a marketer and he once told me that um, good content is screen agnostic. However, um, I mean, you know, that doesn't, you know, really fit in the real world. You know, one size doesn't fit all. You can't take a 30 second commercial, squash it and shove it onto any screen. So how can a brand, how can a client use content intelligently? And do you think there's too much money being spent on content uh, that's not appropriate for the medium? Yeah, I don't know if that was one of our clients. I hope not, because I disagree with that. <laughs> no, I don't, no, I don't no think not one of the clients. Okay, good, because I don't think content is agnostic. And I, you know, the simple ex example of that would be, imagine a brilliant piece of content mm. with a great music track. Mm. And then think about the way that we use Facebook with the sound switched off often. Yeah. So that's no longer a great piece of content if you can't True. hear that great music track. True. So we talk about at Mediacom feed ready content, mm. which means having the right format mm. for a particular platform. So in the case of Facebook, for example, because yeah. you mentioned them, it needs to be short to mm. the point, five, six seconds. It needs to work without yeah. the sound being on mm. and it needs to be relevant. Mm. And the second point, therefore, is that in this world that you talked about before mm. with all these different platforms and all these different choices mm. uh, we can we can highly target mm. audiences what's the point in doing that if we pinpoint these people with different platforms and then serve them all the same message mm. so we need to have very relevant messages and we talk about reach yeah. which is reaching the right people relevance yeah. and then reaction Mm. And some pe and that, and that's about catching people at the right moment in their day when they might actually have time to react. 
Yeah. So speaking of content, and now one of your clients, um, PNG. Yes. PNG is a male grooming brand. Gillette was, uh, you know, recently in the news for its uh, new commercial, which gained a lot of, uh, say, negative sentiments on social media. Do you think in a day and age where consumers are uh, have a platform where they can vent their ire and they're so powerful, shouldn't the brands be more careful of the content they put out? And what does um, n a negative publicity do to a brand's image in the long run? The, the answer to your last question is is it can be very destructive. Mm. Uh, so some brands are prepared to take a risk yeah. and some aren't. And the brands that take risks sometimes it pays off and sometimes it can be catastrophic yeah. uh, I think you know there's, there's no one perfect answer to that because in truth uh, you mentioned Gillette before yeah. uh, some people so men let's talk about men yeah. some men would resonate with it yeah. and like it and some would not yeah. uh, I think what they what they've done in the mm. case of Gillette is stimulate a debate. Mm. So they've kind of brought a debate, they've elevated a debate, yeah. uh, and they have their reasons for maybe wanting to do that. Yeah. You spoke about a more targeted messaging, uh, what you mentioned in your answer. So with the messaging becoming so targeted and the more personalized the medium is going to be, uh, programmatic is going to play, programmatic buying and selling uh, will play a major role. Mm -hmm. So that will also amplify a client's uh, concerns over ad placement. You know, where, where is the ad Absolutely. placed in the right kind of environment, mm -hmm. right to the next, uh, mm -hmm. uh, to the right kind of content. So who is going to take charge of that? Is, will it be the media agency? Is the publisher responsible for it? Or is the digital agency? Who will take charge of that? Mm -hmm. I don't think that companies like Google Hmm. can masquerade as being technology platforms and therefore it's not their responsibility. They have hmm. to provide yeah. safe environments, not just hmm. think about advertising, they have to provide safe environments hmm. for their own users, yeah. right? So th th it's not like there's a divergent yeah. uh, responsibility there, it's a kind of one and the same. So yes, we're there representing our clients. Yeah. Uh, we will put in place as much, uh, we have a lot of technology that's available now to help uh, reduce risk. Hmm. I don't think there is such a thing as risk free. Also in the new future, do we see traditional media also, uh, like television and radio also trading programmatically? It's starting to happen. I mean, hmm. I've seen it in other markets. I, hmm. I mean, radio is, is one example of that. Hmm. Uh, we are seeing television hmm. uh, traded programmatically in some other markets, uh, the UK and the US, but hmm. it's really around not linear, so not yeah old-fashioned TV, but addressable TV, okay. which requires uh, set-top boxes, cable mm. boxes that are sending data both ways. Yeah. I think more broadly are we going to see uh, all, all media traded programmatically? Eventually, yes, but once it becomes addressable. Stephen, transparency is a big buzzword globally. Clients want transparency. So what role will blockchain play in that and what impact will it have in the next two to four years? I think at the moment we're all learning around blockchain. I mean, we, mm. We've certainly got within Group M mm. and uh, Mediacom teams of people uh, looking at that to mm. see how it can be used intelligently in the digital ecosystem. Mm. Uh, we, we are enthusiastic about it because what it does is it uh, democratizes, for want of a better word, it democratizes the digital ecosystem, which at the moment for many people is too opaque. And what blockchain does is really uh, put the ownership of it or mm. the stewardship of it uh, in the marketplace. Mm. Uh, and uh, so it's something that we're enthusiastic about. I think that it's going to take some time yet to evolve into uh, really penetrating the markets. What are your predictions for media in 2019? Well, uh, modest growth globally. Okay. We're, we're predicting 3.5% uh, advertising investment growth. But in India, much more excitingly, uh, our forecast is for 13%. Uh, so India on the back of you know strong GDP growth, uh, still an emerging consumer economy. Uh, we're very optimistic. I'm bullish about India. I think it's an exciting market for us. Mm. It's a very important market and it's one that's still got a lot of potential to uh, fulfill.
look, one of the things, you know, uh, more than one thing that's going to be actually fueling that growth in India in 2019 uh, are you have an election coming up. Yeah. Uh, that will always generate a lot of additional advertising revenue. Uh, and you also have the World Cup coming yeah. here, uh, which is going to create a lot of interest. Obviously, sure. it's a yeah. huge event. Uh, so I think those two things alone, let alone you know the annual IPL, which is such yeah. a big thing here in, in India, uh, I just wish my country were better at cricket, uh, <laughs> is uh, really going to just only add to what would otherwise be, in any case, a, uh, a very positive and growing year uh, because of the things that we, we talked about earlier. Lastly, how can brands grow themselves in this coming year? Uh, they need to invest in the top line okay. and stop just trying to grow by cutting costs because that does not work in the long term, it's not sustainable and you're not really growing your brand or your business, you're just reducing costs. So sure. I, I'm a hugely passionate, big believer in brands. I want to see all advertisers and certainly our clients investing in the top line uh, to grow their business, grow their uh, sales uh, and services and whatever else they do. So. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It is time for us to take a short break. On the other side of this break, Ogilvy has rebranded its two merged entities, Soho Square and Bates Chi and Partners and renamed it as 82.5 Communications. What is the story behind their new approach? Let's find out on the other side of this break.